everybody doing tonight, Momentum? Awesome. How many of you guys are excited about all those baptisms that just happened? Praise God. Come on, let's give it up for them. Let's let them hear us out there. Woo! That is awesome. Man, so proud of them. Well, we are starting a brand new series called The Jesus Movement. And I'm excited about that. And uh, I just want to say before I get into this message, I missed you guys. We had a snowstorm last week. How many of you guys almost died in that snowstorm? I'm glad you're alive. And so I uh, suddenly canceled last week, but safety first. And the last time we all saw each other, we were playing with yo-yos and slime. Do you guys remember that? How many of you guys had a good time at the 90s night? Oh, man. Well, we are here. We're we have ended our relationship goal series, and we're starting a new series called The Jesus Movement, and I'm so pumped about this. I want to let you know, Momentum, I am praying and fasting, not just me, but many of us are praying for a move of God that's beyond our logic, that's beyond our own strength. We're hungering and thirsting that God would show up in such a way and that we would open up to whatever God wants to do in such a way that this generation of young adults would find life and life more abundantly. That more people like we just experienced right here would be delivered from a lifestyle of darkness and death into a kingdom of light and hope and joy and peace. That people would have true life and life abundantly. But how many of you guys know that we can't do that in our own strength? And that everything that we're doing here at Momentum, the reason we're gathered here as an 18 plus God party on a dirt road, is because we have recognized that true life and true hope only comes through the power of Jesus. And that this is the movement that is defined and powered by the strength of Jesus, the name above all names, the king above all kings. How many of you guys agree with that with me? And so we are desperately needing God to show up. We are desperate for a move of God. And I want to read this scripture, and I'm going to go into a great message, a message that I believe is going to challenge some of the things that we have grown up thinking, things that we have been taught. And uh, I want to read from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. And uh, I want to try something a little unique, and I, I just want us to stand up for the reading of the word. And we're just going to honor and reverence what God is doing in this place. We're going to honor the word that God has given us. And so we can put that scripture on the screen from Mark 10, and we're going to read this, and then we're going to pray and get into an awesome message. But this is Jesus talking to a rich young ruler, and it says this, as he went out into the street, a man came running, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? So we have a young man who is concerned about eternal life. Am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to go somewhere else? How can I have life and life more abundantly? Just like many of us are wondering, how can I have true life? Not just go through the motions, not just exist, but have life. And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. Then he goes on, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. And the young man says, teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. I love this. Verse 21. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. <laughs> he said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come, follow me. That's a hard ask. For some of us in this room, it's not really that hard of an ask. Because all you own is an Altima. <laughs> I see you, Rick. <laughs> Verse 22. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things. Not about to let go. Have you guys ever seen that? Someone's experiencing the presence of God. God is speaking to that person. Someone asks for a sign and God shows up in such a special way, but for some reason, they're just unwilling to let go of that possession, that relationship, that idea, that hurt, that bitterness, that unforgiveness. And it says his face clouded over. He knew he couldn't let go. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and was not about to let go. And then looking at his disciples, Jesus said, do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all? 
to enter God's kingdom. The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into the kingdom's God. You know what? I just watched a movie on Netflix about this girl and three camels. Not a very good movie, but those camels would not be able to go through the eye of a needle. You can quote me on that. Verse 26, that set the disciples back on their heels. Then who has any chance at all, they asked. And Jesus was blunt. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. How many of you guys know you haven't been able to save yourself? How many of you guys have tried to be your own leader and it just hasn't worked? But at some point in your life, you let go and you said, God, help me. I give you my life. And that's made all the difference. Come on. And so we serve a God who he helps us when we can't help ourselves. We serve a God who is our leader when we can't lead ourselves. And we're going to be talking about that in this message. And I'm pumped about this. So let's just stretch our hands to heaven and let's surrender to whatever God has in this place. So dear Father, we just stretch our hands out as a symbolic gesture of saying we surrender to whatever you have planned. Lord, very much unlike this young man who is holding on to the cares of life and he's unwilling to let go and follow you, Jesus, with outstretched arms, we just say we surrender every single part of our lives to you because we know that you are the true giver of life. You are the true giver of hope. And so, Lord, we surrender it to you, realizing it's no real sacrifice because you give us everything we need. We pray. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You guys can maybe may be seated. Well, this rich young ruler, this young man, he knew to call Jesus a teacher. He knew the right things to say. I have kept these commandments and, since my youth. And Jesus said, all right, you call me a teacher, but I'm going to ask you to do something. Sell all your possessions. And he was unwilling to do so. And uh, I see this dynamic of, how frustrating it is to try to teach someone who is unteachable. How hard it is to disciple someone who's unwilling to submit to someone's ways. Have you ever had, had someone come up to you and ask you for advice and you just spit gold? You give them the best advice ever. You tell them exactly what to do, how to do it. You've gone through it yourself. And then what do they do? They don't do it. They don't do it. They don't listen. Why? They buy that Ultima. Oh my gosh. Wait, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and you're like, why can't you just listen? And then like two years later, they're like, man, I should have listened to you. I know. <laughs> you know, I had this situation where I was living in Korea for a year. And I walked into a uh, boxing gym. And I walked right up to this Filipino trainer. And I said, sir. I want you to train me how to fight professionally in three months. And I want you to place me in a match so that I can prove my strength and my dexterity and my courage. And he agreed to train me. And so for oh, so many months, I would go in there and uh, I had this routine. I would go there and he would tell me exactly what to do. He said, all right, I'll put you in a match, but only if you do things my way. And so he had me... First thing, whenever I'd walk into the gym and I would go four times a day, I'd work out in the mornings on my own, and that night I would go to the boxing gym and train with this guy. He'd have me run up 10 stories of stairs five times before I would even be able to train with him. And then he would have me grab a sledgehammer and hammer this, uh, this tire to develop my back muscles because how many of you guys know boxing is a leg sport? Don't listen to anybody else who denies that. All right, Shyla. Boxing is a leg sport, as you can see. <laughs> and so I'd use the sledgehammer, and then I would do all these ab exercises. I actually got uh, Manny Pacquiao's uh, ab workout, and so I was able to do that. And I would be destroyed, and then he would teach me, and he would have me uh, do some shadow boxing. He would show me different jabs, different hooks, different uppercuts, different ways to guard, and he taught me how to keep my composure uh, when I got hit, so sometimes he would just smack me in the nose and be like, peace, be still. Like, oh, this, all right. 
just had to keep my composure, but I asked him to train me, and he would have me do all these things. He would have me get on a jump rope, and he would have me run, and he would have me just look in a mirror and watch myself fight for hours, and then he would, he would just have me do these crazy requests, and as I obeyed him, and as I agreed to them, he would give me more and more, and until finally I gained his trust, and he said, all right, you're ready. I'm going to let you fight one of our professional boxers. I'm going to have you spar. And the other trainees, the other people practicing to become boxers, they will watch you and then we will basically debrief and uh, pro and con how you are fighting. And I had all this training. I was like, man, I have peace. I know how to keep my stance. I know how to evade punches. I know how to keep my guard up. And so I got into the ring and this guy was very strong, very Korean, if you know what I mean, and uh, very tall, had a long reach, and I got into the, the, the ring, and uh, the bell rings, a lot of rings, the bell ring, ring as I was in the ring, <laughs> took off my rings, <laughs> all right, and uh, so the fight starts, and this guy comes at me, and I'm like thinking, all right, got to do my training, got to keep the box, got to keep my guard up, you know, Mike Tyson, peekaboo style if I need to. All right, I just got to keep my composure. But I used to fight a lot as a 100-pound high schooler, and uh, I didn't win a lot of those fights, but I got into a lot of fights. And all my training that I had been taught went out the window, and I went into brawl mode. We're talking, I charged him, and I was like, ah! And I just, like, started going to his body. I think I threw a few knees in there. I was like, come on! I was, like, slapping him. And I, I, was, I was, like, out of breath within 20 seconds. I, I lost everything. And, and then he started beating me, and it, it felt like time stood still. And then I started just flailing. I'm, like, trying to pull his hair, but I have gloves on. It doesn't work. And now my ears are ringing in the ring as the bell rings. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I should have wore my rings. And uh, uh, my, my trainer went in there after all this time of practicing and teaching me the way. He goes, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not doing anything I taught you. You're not allowed to spar for a month. It's like, ah, man. And he felt that frustration that I'm pretty sure Jesus felt in this passage where someone is trying to get wisdom and advice, but they're unwilling to follow. They're unwilling to be learners. They're unwilling to be humble. Just like I was in that moment, all of my past, the way I'd been grown up, kicked in instead of this new way of life I was trying to operate in. And this can happen in our Christian lives because we all have histories, we all have different foundations, and we're trying to live for God, we're trying to live for Jesus, we're trying to be part of this Jesus movement. But so many times our own ways of doing life, our own thoughts, our own strategies start to replace the strategies that Jesus gives us in his word, and in our lives. And uh, I want to talk about Jesus movement. I want to define this a little bit for us. And I want to talk about uh, a fancy concept of discipleship and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Most of us in this room identify ourselves as Christian, which is an interesting concept because there's not a lot of definition behind the word Christian. You know, if I said the word comedian, you could define what a comedian is. If I said the word dinosaur, most of you could identify what a dinosaur is. If I said the word Ultima, most of you guys would know that's the kind of car Rick drives. Do you drive an Ultima? Why am I saying this so much? And there's a lot of definition behind that. But with the word Christian, it's interesting because there's so many definitions of it. If I divided all of us into groups of four, and I said, all right, in your group of four, I want you to define what Christian means. And then we all came together and gave a presentation on the stage. I'm pretty sure that we would have many, many different definitions for Christian. It's not something that we have been ably, you know, easily able to define. You know, many of us, we, we said, you know, being a Christian means I, I prayed a prayer and now I'm a Christian. Or being a Christian means I was baptized and so I'm a Christian. Or we would say I went through a confirmation class so I'm a Christian. Or I went to a Christian school or I've read the whole Bible because I was Christian. I remember when I first started going to church, I had a Bible with my name on it. And I thought that maybe made me a Christian. 
I didn't really know. And we can have all these different definitions. For some of us, when we were, you know, a little younger, we thought we were Christian because we had a bracelet that said WWJD, right? We're like, I'm, I'm super Christian. And then many of us, we, we thought, okay, I used to be a Christian, but then uh, I, I, I stopped being a Christian and I'm, I'm no longer uh, saved. And then others of us in this room would say that's impossible. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never not be a Christian once you are a Christian. Or, you know, some of us who, uh, you know, maybe grew up Catholic were like, okay, uh, you know, I'm part of the true church. This is the true church. Everybody else is like, they're wrong. They're not the real Christians. I'm the real Christian. And we have all these different definitions and all these different ideas. And some of us believe, you know, you know, you have to pray a prayer in a specific way and then you're a Christian. So how many of you guys are like this where you've, you've prayed like a hundred times, Jesus, please save me or make sure I'm going to heaven because you're not sure if it took the first 50 times. Be honest. Be honest. Come on. Anybody like that? You pray that? You're like, okay, I'm just praying one more time in case you didn't hear it. In case he's, you know, uh, on T-Mobile, which according to Verizon has really bad service. And uh, maybe Jesus didn't hear my prayer. And so we have all these different uh, definitions. Maybe you have some uh, family members or, that aren't Christian or friends, and they probably define Christian as, you know, judgmental, homophobic, moralists who think they're the only ones going to heaven and secretly relish that fact. You know, maybe that's how we define Christian. But it's interesting because when we look at the scriptures, uh, Christian is not something that we see very often. And if you actually study and look this up in your Bible, and I hope you go home after the service and look this up in your Bible, you'll find that the term Christian is never used by people part of the Jesus movement. It's never really used by the Christians. In fact, the New Testament, which is the, the second half of the Bible, after Jesus had lived, died, and resurrected from the grave, it only uses the word Christian three times. And so the early followers of Jesus did not call themselves Christian. Where do we see the word Christian? In Acts 26, 28, Agrippa said to Paul, so this is Agrippa talking about who isn't really a believer. He says, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? All right, that's one example. 1 Peter 4, 16, this is where you could make, probably make an argument that a Christian referred to himself as a Christian, but it's kind of a stretch still. Yet, if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a grace, but glorify God because you bear this name. How about this? Acts 11, 25 through 26. This is the first time we see the term Christian. Uh, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it is for an entire year that they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. This, this is it. This is all the scriptures have that use the word Christian. And even in this time, in Acts 11, what had happened was the early church had scattered, and there was this place called Antioch, which was basically uh, that world's version of Asia, you know, so Turkey Minor, things like that. And people are there. There's all these Christians gathering. And so they're like, whoa, we need to teach these people. Let's go grab Barnabas. And he'll help us. Barnabas gets there, and he's like, whoa, there's so many more believers here than I ever realized. We need some help. Let's get Paul. And so Paul gets there, and that was when Christians were first called Christians. But here's the thing. It wasn't a word that believers used to identify themselves. It was a word that non-believers used to identify Christians. And it wasn't necessarily a term of endearment. It was kind of a derogatory term. It was kind of a term that was like, oh. Those Christians. You know, this week I just learned a term that's uh, towhead. Have you ever heard of this term? Towhead? Who's heard of the word towhead? Who has never heard of the word towhead? I literally just learned this term last week. Apparently, when people are born with blonde hair and white skin, they are towheads. Am I defining that right? Yes. And so that's not like something... A person calls himself with great pride. Like, you know, when I ran into Mitch Brockway at the men's conference and, you know, his throat's filled with blood because he's worshiping the Lord so hard. I'm not like, ah, classic toehead. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Who here is a toehead? Who here? It sounds racial, but I don't think it is. <laughs> I feel like that's a bad word, but I'm saying it strongly. 
I can get away with it because I'm brown. So <laughs> toeheads in this place. And so it's not like a term of endearment, maybe it is. I remember the first time I went to Puerto Rico, this 80-year-old woman got in my face and just said, Negro. <laughs> That's all she ever said to me. <laughs> she meant that as a term of endearment, so they told me. But toehead was not. <laughs> so the early church, they were called Christians, but it wasn't a term of endearment. And I want to turn to a, a Roman historian, Tacitus. And this guy was not a uh, believer. He was not even a religious person. He was a, a historian that used to document different uh, emperors of that time. He documented about five different emperors, especially one called Nero and Tiberius. And Tiberius was the emperor during the time of Jesus's life. And he actually writes about Christians and specifically uh, Nero. So Nero is this guy who kind of wanted to restart a city. He wanted to burn it to the ground have the jobs and the evil and all the corruption disappear. He's basically like biblical days Ra's al Ghul, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. He's like, you know, the head of the league. He was the, the demon's head. Uh, some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Watch Arrow, not that I'm endorsing it, but watch it if you want to know what I'm talking about. Or the Dark Knight, I guess. I don't know what I'm promoting here. Promoting the Jesus movement. All right, Jesus movement. <laughs> so uh, he is an emperor, and he's trying to start over a whole civilization by burning it down. And uh, this didn't go well with the people. Believe it or not, they didn't really appreciate that. They weren't like, thank you for burning down my whole civilization. They're like, this is a really bad move. So Nero, he decides to blame it on the Christians. Blame it on the Christians, a term that he was using, not as a term of endearment, but a Christian term to really kind of degrade them. And this is kind of a good argument, too, for the validity of Scripture, because this is not a religious source that I'm about to read. This is just a secular historian writing about people like Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ and what happened. So I want to read a quote that um, this Roman historian, historian Tacitus writes about 64 AD when this area is burned down. And it says this, Consequently, to get rid of the report, so Nero didn't want credit for burning down the city, so he's trying to get rid of the report. To get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. So who calls them Christians? The populace, not the Christians. So Christus, from whom the name had its origin. So this is pretty interesting because we know as believers that Christ is a title, not a name. Christ means Messiah the one that was going to return to Israel and save the Jewish people from the Roman occupation. That's what they were praying for because they had been conquered by Rome. So they're hoping for the Messiah or the Christ, a title, to rescue them. But these people in the civilization didn't know Jewish history and prophetic literature, so they just thought Christ was the last name of Jesus. So they would have been like, hey, Mr. Christ, how you doing? And so Christ is from whom the name had its origin, Christians, suffered the extreme penalty, so that's what they call the, the crucifixion, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators. Did I say that right? Procurators. Pontius Pilate, or Pilatus. Sound familiar? This is like a great argument for the historicity of the Bible. Because it points to a story that we read in the scriptures. So in this, a city is burned down. Who does he blame it on? Uh, a, a, a people group that wasn't really esteemed highly, the Christians. And so we see that Christians didn't call themselves Christians. The populace called themselves Christians. These were outsiders calling them Christians. And the Christians or the believers called themselves something very much different. And it's kind of good that they did because, you know, have you ever wondered why there are so many different denominations in the church or why there are so many different beliefs in the church or so many different understandings in the church and interpretations of how church life is supposed to be or what this Jesus movement is supposed to be like? It's because we've been using this vague term of Christian that is never defined in the scriptures. And so it's confusing for all of us because we can kind of live however we want to live and call ourselves Christians. 
We can do whatever we want and call ourselves Christians because it's only used in the New Testament three times and it's never defined. And so we see early followers of Jesus primarily call themselves something completely different. They call themselves disciples. Let's see this. In Acts 9, verse 26, this is this. When he had come to Jerusalem, this is Paul, after being a murdering Jew who had been murdering Christians or believers, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. The disciples. Everybody say disciples. So when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a Christian. No, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Very good. So let's, let's look at another one. Acts 9, 36. Was this for the ladies? Can girls be disciples? I don't know. It's International Women's Day. Let's find out. Where are my ladies at? Come on. All right. All right. Pastor Jen just pumped me up. I have a baby boy, and because he's been in my wife's body, he has estrogen in him and can actually lactate as a baby boy because of a buildup of estrogen. Isn't that interesting? It's International Women's Day. It's not gross. It's natural. It's beautiful. It's the gift of life. Don't judge my son. He's three weeks old, Jimmy. Come on. Three weeks old. <laughs> All right. So verse 36, let's look at a disciple. At. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. You got a name. Where's Megan? I saw Megan earlier. She here, she leaves, she getting convicted. Anyway. Tell her to name her, her kid Dorcas. All right. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. So she, we see this term disciple, and this is what we see throughout the scriptures. And, you know, this is kind of a scary thing if this is the first time you realize that there's different terminology between disciple and Christian. Because many of us have chosen to live our lives however we want and call ourselves Christian. You know, we can be addicted to this, we can live our lifestyle, we can justify this, we can be in a relationship like this, and, you know, I'm a Christian, I do what I want. But the early believers called themselves disciples. What does disciple mean? A disciple is basically, it means a learner, an adherent, a pupil, a follower, an apprentice, and discipline is the mark of a disciple. When I decided to follow my boxing trainer, I couldn't do whatever I wanted. I had to box in a certain way to be considered his student. I had to box in a certain way to be considered trained by him and worthy to enter the ring on his time and his terms because I was his disciple. You know, I love kung fu movies. Anybody like kung fu movies? So many times someone will come and say, you, you just beat me up. I'm bowing before you. Train me. If you watch The Golden Cane Warrior on Netflix, you'll see that example. I really like that movie. It involves sick fighting and old ladies. So opening scene, an old lady gets beat up. Very entertaining. Don't judge me. Three weeks old, Jimmy. Come on. All right. So, uh, you know, if you watch Naruto, Guy Lee and Rock Lee, right? They're disciples. If you ever watch The Karate Kid, there you are. How did I miss you? <laughs> are you calling me Dorcas? Or are you gonna? Do you agree to name your child Dorcas? Yeah, I'll, take I'll take it. it. Let's give her a round of applause. How do you feel about that? <laughs> you approve? <laughs> Penelope Dorcas Ramondo. <laughs> All right. So a disciple is a learner, adherent, a pupil, a follower, an apprentice. This makes our, our spiritual lives look a lot different because a disciple starts to look like the master. A disciple starts to talk like the master. And my question for you is, are you a Christian, which is really undefinable, or are you a disciple of Jesus? If I sent a reporter to watch your life, to watch your words, to watch your actions, how you conducted, and they wrote an article about you, would they say, 
wow, watching this person's life for a month was just like watching the Bible happen in real life. This person reminds me of Jesus. Man, they seem so close to their heavenly father. Wow, when they are around people, they pray for them and they get healed or their lives are restored. When they're around people, they just bring life and life abundantly. It's like they speak with a spiritual authority. It's like their words aren't just words. It's not like they're just reciting something. But when they speak, you can tell that they're living a life that's different than everybody is who may be just claiming to be a Christian. There's something different about that person. Is that how you would describe yourself as a disciple, someone who has spent so much time with Jesus, spent so much time in the word that people can't really tell if they're hearing a word from you or hearing a word from God? Or are you a Christian, living however you want, doing whatever you want, watching whatever you want, making fun of little babies? I mean, what is your reality? (laughs) I'm just kidding, Jay. I love you. Discipline is the mark of a disciple. And, and disciples, man, they want to know how their master is doing something. You know, a disciple says yes to the master before a master even asks the question. You know, a disciple is so humble and willing to learn. A disciple is a learner. Let's look at some points about learners. Number one, learners look for knowledge. Do you have a desire to learn? Do you have a desire to understand the way Jesus thinks? Have you read the scriptures yourself? When was the last time you picked up a Christian book and tried to understand theology? Do you just say you want to go deeper, but you have no action behind it? Learners look for knowledge. They seek the truth. Number two, learners are humble. We submit ourselves to the teachings of Jesus. We want God to change the way we think. We don't look for scriptures to justify what we already believe. We look at scriptures to shape our worldview because we're humble. Number three, learners are willing to change. We understand that Jesus offers us a new paradigm and a way of thinking. And number four, learners act on what they know. Do you act on the scripture that you hear? Do you act on the things that we preach here week in and week out? When we say, hey, you know, Toss up a pea. This is how you pray. This is how you pray the Lord's Prayer. But then you realize, wow, I don't remember the last time I prayed. Well, then you're probably not a disciple because your life isn't being conformed by the master's example. You know, when we say, hey, here's a do-it-yourself series. This is a technique for reading the scripture. Here's how to honor your God with money. Or this is what it means to be compelled by love. Or here are relationship goals. This is how you can live for God. This is how you can honor God. This is how you can build on a solid foundation. But you find yourself just hearing things, being entertained by messages, and never changing the way you live your life. Then you're probably just a Christian and not a disciple. Because your life isn't being conformed to the example of Jesus's. And this is a scary reality because most of us hide behind this undefinable term Christian. But the early believers never called themselves Christians. They called themselves disciples. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, what is it? Go into all the world and make converts of all nations. No. Go into all the world and make people pray a prayer. No. Go into all the world and give them WWJD bracelets. No. Go into all the world and watch the Left Behind movie, but the one without Nicolas Cage. (laughs) No. (laughs) It's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, go into all the world and make disciples, disciples, teaching them everything that I have taught you. Are we doing that? Or are we just... Christians. And so I really want to highlight the potential of a Jesus movement. And I want to close with this scripture and this example, and I'm just kind of setting this up for the rest of the month. But I want us to zero in on this time where Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to be killed. He's about to be executed for uh, a perfect life, but him really starting an insurrection against the Roman occupation, starting a new way of life. And so Jesus is about to die, and he's gathered all of his disciples, and he's about to give them his last words, his last instructions. And 
You know, how many, how many of you guys have parents that are kind of like helicopter parents a little bit, and, you know, you're about to go to college or something, and they're like, all right, before you got to go, I, gotta, I just got to tell you this one last thing, okay? This is how you do laundry. Okay, all right, but you get, make sure you wash your sheets more than once a semester, okay? And, you know, you're just, you're getting all these last instructions. And this is kind of Jesus' moment where he's bringing his disciples, he knows he's about to die, and, uh, and he, he's going to give them kind of some final instructions about what to do. So in John 13, 33, he says this, I'm going soon. And a, a new command I give you, and this is after he had just washed their feet and served them, and they're a little uncomfortable about the God of the universe washing their feet, humbling himself. But he says this, a new command I give you, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment. Check this out. And uh, so the disciples have got to be thinking, oh, wow, Jesus is going to give us something new. It's going to be good. Something nobody else has heard. It's going to be something original. I need something fresh. I need something great. You know, Jesus, take us deeper. Jesus, give me, give me that real good teaching. Give me that awesome stuff. I don't want this boring, same old stuff leading our friends to Christ, witnessing, loving, giving. Give, give us something good, something fresh. All right, Jesus, like, check this out. Something totally fresh, totally original. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. I'm like, Jesus, that's dumb. <laughs> That's kind of your whole deal. (laughs) But he says, love one another. And then he adds a little something. Just as I have loved you. Powerful. You should also love one another. So he's saying, love each other as I've loved you. And he says this, by this, everyone will know that you are my Christians. No, everyone will know that you are my. If you love if you have love for one another. I love this. You know, he, he, it's a simple message. If you just love one another. And this is how Jesus wants us to be identified as disciples, by our love for one another. You know, this world, man, this generation will change as we love one another. And this is the heart of this Jesus movement. This is the heart of what we do. Because I want to challenge us to even love each other, love the disciples in this room even more than we love the world. That's a crazy thought, isn't it? But that's how Jesus says we will be identified as disciples, that we would love each other like he loved us, and that we would be identified as disciples who love. But let's be honest. Most of us in this room have the least grace for Christians. We have the least love for Christians. Christians are like the only group in the world that is so willing to kill its own wounded. Oh, did you see that that girl? She's worshiping up there. But, man, if you see what she did, you know, see what she says, what she wore at that club, man, she's not. We don't love. We're just looking to, gotcha, you failed, you know. And Jesus says, love each other as I, I've loved you. And I, I'm just like, whoa, this is so powerful because you got to imagine, you know, like, they're like, whoa, we got to love each other like you loved us. Like, that's a big thing because, I don't know, I'm, I, I, I imagine Matthew being like, I don't know if I can do that, Jesus. And Jesus is like, you, Matthew, remember when I met you? You were a traitor to the Jewish people. You were a tax collector. You are a mafia man. You're exhorting people for extra money, your own people. But I brought you in, and I loved you. And uh, Matthew, I want you to love people that same way. I mean, that, that's pretty powerful, you know. And uh, I can imagine Jesus is looking at Nathaniel, you know, one of the disciples. And Nathaniel's thinking, oh, my gosh, how am I going to love like you did, Jesus? I, I, I don't even like these guys. I'm supposed to love the disciples. How many of you guys ever thought that about Christians? I don't even like them. I don't even want to be around them. You know, especially you see all the Facebook wars, especially, you know, during this voting time, Christians are just at each other's throats. It's embarrassing, isn't it? Why would anybody ever want to become a disciple when they see us attacking each other? And so I can imagine Nathaniel's like, I don't even like these disciples. You want me to love them? And she's just like, Nathaniel, are you kidding me? Do you remember when I first met you? 
you're sitting under that tree and someone was telling you that, you know, the Messiah was here, the Savior of the whole Jewish people and the, the human race, you remember what you said? You dissed my entire people group. You said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel, you dissed my whole family. <laughs> you dissed my whole city. But guess what? I, I took you in, and I loved you, and I built you up, and I believed in you, and I took a risk on you, and I, I made you someone who's going to change the world because I loved you. And I want you to love these disciples just like I love you. And I, I just want to, I don't know, help us imagine it. What if we got this right? What if we at Momentum truly loved one another? What if we truly loved Christians? What if we created an environment where people are like peeking in and they're like, is it really possible for people to love each other like that? Is that real? Have you ever gone to a wedding and you're like, man, those two are so in love that it makes me want to have a love like that. Could you imagine if we created an environment like that and momentum? We're like, man, this community is so full of love, so full of Jesus. They've got each other's back. And they're thinking, man, I don't want to be an outsider just looking in. I want to be a part of that movement. I want, I want to be a part of those people who, who are just like Jesus, that bring in outcasts and make them feel like kings and queens, that take people who consider themselves losers and fills them with life and potential and builds them up as leaders so that they can change the world. And that's my dream for momentum, that we would be a Jesus movement that loves each other just like Jesus loves us, and through that, we could change the world. If Christians got this, man... There wouldn't be wars. There wouldn't be such segregation. There wouldn't be such hatred. We could change the world just like the early church did. They toppled an empire without raising a sword or a shield. They just created a community that loved each other so much that it changed the course of history. And this Jesus movement that we're promoting and preaching and praying for, that opportunity and that potential is right here, right now. If we will simply do what Jesus did, and be disciples and will be identified as disciples if we simply love each other as Jesus loves us. And I, I think it's such a beautiful thing. I see it trickling. You know, last week or like three weeks ago, I was so like exhausted with my baby and uh, Amrita and I were and uh, I, I just posted something on Facebook and I said, I'm so thankful for family who's been willing to stay up all night I even have family right here that they're willing just to come and help us and serve us. And uh, I posted something on Facebook. I said, I'm just so thankful for family that's willing to love and help us. And uh, this one girl said, man, I'm a single mom with twins. And I, I haven't had a night's sleep in like three months. I haven't had a break. I haven't had anybody come to help. And I was like, man, I can understand that. And I was like, I'm not in a position to help you because I'm trying to take care of my own child. And, you know, young adults are, like, making fun of him, and I got to protect him. Uh, I got I to gotta take care of my own family. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, uh, so I just posted something on Facebook, and I said, hey, single mom with twins. The twins are on different sleeping schedules, which sounds horrible. <laughs> And one is sleeping, the other is awake, so she can never sleep. And uh, I just said, can someone help her? Man, I saw this passage come alive. People are like, hey, I offer to volunteer once a month for the whole year. I'll come over. I will love her. And I just saw Christians stepping up to love Christians. And then my non-Christian friends or my non-discipled friends who are peeking in on Facebook, they're just looking at all these Christians loving each other. And I can't help but imagine and wonder, man, how has that impacted their heart? Maybe they're one step closer to Jesus because they're seeing how we love each other. And so with this Jesus movement, I want to challenge you guys to make a commitment. Here it is. Will you choose to be a disciple rather than a Christian? Will you choose to actually conform the way you live the way you talk, the way you conduct yourselves 
in a way that reminds people of Jesus? Or will you call yourself a Christian and do whatever you want because it can't be defined? That's my challenge. It's simple. And it's the heart of this Jesus movement. We're going to dive deeper and deeper into this. So let's stand up to our feet. We're going to sing a song of worship. And I, I believe God is doing things in our heart. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And if that's in your heart, you're saying, you know what? I don't want to just be a Christian who does whatever I want, just like that rich young ruler. He's a teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him advice, but he was unwilling to follow him because Jesus was just a teacher to him. Jesus was just someone he was a fan of. And it says that rich young ruler refused to follow Jesus. But I believe that there's a Jesus movement rising up right now where we don't just call Jesus teacher. We don't just say we're a fan of Jesus, that we think Jesus is cool. But we are a movement that says, you know what, Jesus, you're my master, and I will be your disciple. I will follow your instructions. I will replicate what you did on the earth. I will study the way you lived, and I will incorporate it into my lifestyle and my mindset. And if that's you in this place, and you want to say, I radically and fully commit to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, just raise your hand. It doesn't have to even be for the first time. But let's just remove, renew our commitment to be part of this Jesus movement, where we radically submit to the lifestyle of Jesus. And we say we're disciples, and our goal is to live and talk and breathe and look just like Jesus, just like Jesus only did what the Father did. We only do what we see Jesus doing. So let's sing a song of worship, and let's make this our prayer as we dedicate our lives to the Lord.